So it is a commonplace in law and political economy scholarship to hear calls to democratize institutions for areas of law. And this panel will interrogate what democratization might look like in practice across very different institutional contexts. Utility regulation, worker cooperatives, administrative agencies, industrial policy, and across the state. By engaging across these distinct settings, panelists aim to shed light on the conditions necessary for more genuinely egalitarian democratic control over state and economy, and consider what it will take to get there. So, who are the panelists? Well, surely they don't need any introductions, so I'll give a very short version. Uh, to my immediate right is Amy Kamczynski, a professor of law at Yale Law School and co-director of the LBE Project and the Global Health Justice Partnership. To her right is Joel Michaels, who's a 3L at Yale Law School. No, please applaud. Uh, <laughs> you'll see much more from him in the near future, I'm sure. Uh, he has previously worked at the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, or OIRA, as we all uh, know it, and the U.S. Department of the Treasury. To his right, also a veteran of OIRA, is uh, Sabil Roman, an associate professor of law at Brooklyn Law School, co-director of the LP Project. Uh, he previously served as the associate administrator leading the office of OIRA uh, for the Biden administration, which he joined from Demos, a racial justice think tank and advocacy organization where he served as president. And then on the end, we have Sandeep Mathison, the legal director at the Open Markets Institute and author of a forthcoming book entitled Democracy and Power on the History and Future of Cooperative and Public Power in the United States, under contract at the University of Chicago Press. Um, and he will be talking about some aspects of that book. So, without further ado, uh, Amy. Oh, no, sorry, so we'll sum this up. Yes. yes. Um, great. Well, thanks, Luke. And uh, uh, it's super pleasure, thrill uh, to get to do this panel with everybody. I thought it was great to come just now. Um, and so, uh, and this is good for uh, that I'm kicking off in the sense that my third a little bit more conceptual about how we want to think about this thing that is structuralist, uh, that we might think of as structuralist policy. And I should first say, like, I mean, there's so many friends uh, in the room and in the space. I feel like there's like lots of thank yous, if not at least my predecessor to our sharing is here. Uh, there are a number of folks who have heard an earlier version of this paper, Tala, others um, that I gave earlier this semester. So anyway, I hope this continued progress uh, along, along the way. Um, so what I want to talk about is the idea of structural change. And what I'm especially interested in is um, how the concept of structural change, uh, uh, what how it carries into statecraft. Right, so I'm interested in how uh, this has been part because of my own lived experience over the last you know, five years, but I'm interested in how sort of uh, aspirational transformational uh, calls for major structural reform for our political economy, how that uh, is or isn't metabolized by the policymaking apparatus and what that implies for how, uh, how we should be designing policy with structural transformation in London. And, and uh, you know, there's a normative project here, right? I think the goal is to achieve an egalitarian, equitable, inclusive, democratic political economy. But to get there, we need um, structural transformations that shift power and that alter our basic, the basic structure of our political economy. Those policies are really hard to like shoehorn into a whole conceptual paradigm. And I think that's a lot of what we're uh, struggling with uh, in that. So that's uh, what I'm interested in. Uh, let me start first by saying a little bit about the kind of old uh, model of policy design that we're up against. And we've heard this sort of, we'll continue to hear this throughout the, uh, the conference, right? I think, you know, we can call it neoliberalism, we can call it whatever you want, but, there, but I think the inherited way that we, uh, that we have is uh, itself very much uh, a, a structural sort of approach to the state fact, right? If you think about uh, what it means to deregulate, what it means to deconstruct the administrative state, what it means to uh, impose uh, punitive, racialized, and gendered ways of uh, uh, executing uh, safety net programs, right? These are all, in a sense, structured with that they encode um, a particular view about social relations and power and hierarchy. Um, often under the guise of, you know, get uh, free markets and, and get the state out of the way. Um, but for purposes of progressive reform, what's fascinating to me about the, the neoliberal paradigm is the way in which 
These structural changes were accomplished under an ideology or framework that is anti-structural in a way that I think a lot of progressive centrist liberals have absorbed into their own conception of state. Growth. So if you think about the, the counter arguments that are often thrown up in the face of uh, attempts at structural reform, uh, they have uh, there, there are a lot of common moves that uh, that opponents, skeptics, critics employ and. Here I'm very much indebted to uh, Albert Hirschman's great little volume, uh, uh, The Rhetoric of Reaction, Perversity, Control, and Jeopardy, is sort of in the back of my mind as I was writing this paper. Um, when it comes to structuralism, I think there are these three common rhetorical or conceptual moves that, that we're up against. And I want to sort of name them and articulate them because that sets the backdrop for then what an active structuralist playbook looks like. And I'll move quickly. Um, the first move, I think, is the erasure of structure as a concept or as a target of policy. So if you think in the uh, you know, the classic case of, you know, some Hayek's work, but you see this all over the place. There's an attempt to sort of deny the existence of a structure in the first place that needs to be reformed, right? Um, I famously rejects this in his uh, reject of the concept of social justice. Um, more prosaically, if you look at uh, you know, a lot of John Roberts' opinions, with which many of us are obsessed, um, uh, you know, think of something like Shelby County or parents involved, like Rob, the classic move that Roberts makes in his jurisprudence is to deny the existence of structural disparities when it comes to race as a, as a justification for why we should um, uh, remove the yoke of the Voting Rights Act, for example, from our constitutional uh, law. It's no longer needed anymore, so we, don't, so we can safely uh, dismantle VRA uh, Section 5 and Section 2. Um, and it's partly an erasure of the idea of a structural disparity uh, of, of racial inequity in the country. So there's this move to erase the idea that structure is even a thing that needs to be reformed. Uh, the second move that we're up against, or kind of set of assumptions that we're up against, um, is a kind of familiar cost benefit, right? It's extremely dangerous and costly and expensive to break up, uh, you know, to break up monopolies, and we're losing all these benefits that come with. Uh, the efficiency gains of, of concentration and mergers and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or even when, S even when SPV Bank failed, and we can talk about financial reform, I think there's, there's a lot. Uh, all of these was really manifested the financial reform uh, debate, right? Same kind of thing. It's extremely costly to have, um, if we were to have had a more robust uh, set of restrictions on systemically important institutions of various kinds. Uh, and then the last one is really one about administrability. That even if we think it was, it would be worthwhile to impose structural reforms uh, of some kind, uh, we just do not believe that the state is capable of implementing them and uh, effectuating them uh, efficiently, accountably, uh, without sort of falling prey to you know uh, familiar critiques of capture and corruption and, and so forth. So I think it's worth naming all of these, not you know, and we can jazz them intellectually, but I think there's a big way in which they, all of these uh, concepts have been metabolized and assimilated into the policy imaginary. And so much of what I think is important and exciting about this moment uh, is you know, there's an attempt, I think, to start to break out of that when it comes to policy. So let me say a little bit about what I think a, a structuralist toolkit that would replace this way of thinking looks like, and then I'll wrap up and uh, turn it to my colleagues, because um, I think both the papers are really fantastic, exciting uh, explorations of like, what this would look like really concretely. Okay, so I think a uh, structural toolkit has a uh, would have a couple of components. Uh, one is a set of uh, policies that would uh, 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 that would kind of address the concentrations of economic power that shape the background uh, operation of our, our political economy. So think antitrust, think financial reform, right? These are our debates about uh, breakup, about structural separation, uh, about um, uh, limitations on what uh, concentrated uh, uh, actors might be able to able to do as a matter of conduct. That's very abstract. Completely, I'm thinking of debates like um, when it comes to internet platforms. You know, should we have um, do, should we have antitrust actions on platforms? Should we uh, how do we break up uh, um, uh, industries that are concentrated? Uh, when it comes to financial regulations, right? You could imagine a trade that if you're going to operate. If you're going to operate a business that basically depends on the uh, franchising, you know, it's sorry, I'm going to talk about how to argue the franchising of the state's power to uh, to print money, then we're going to impose or to be imposing extremely severe restrictions on what you can you can't do with that. Um, these are uh, modes of, I think, either break up structural restraints, break up more structural restraints on, uh, on private power. The second move, I think, is uh, our tool uh, approach, policy design approach. 
uh, I think has to do with decommodification. So um, here we might think of safety net programs. I mean, part of what's fascinating about something like the CTC is the way in which um, uh, kind of arguments for basic income or job guarantees are ways to try to decommodify labor, um, ways in which we might be trying to decommodify care um, in ways that are empowering and enabling and ennobling of the communities and people who, uh, who we care about. Um, a related version of that is direct public provision. Right? You could imagine like more direct forms of public provision, not only as goods and services, but also um, um, basic utilities, right? Some uh, exploration of like, what does it look like to actually cooperatively or, or, or uh, publicly run utilities is I think um, fascinating uh, in that respect. Um, and then the last one I think has to do with democracy, checks and balances. So how do we uh, design our political economic institutions in ways that incorporate um, real accountability and power for the most impacted communities. Uh, my colleague Justin Simonson is here. We, uh, she's written a lot about this. We did some work on this together. Um, so plenty of others, and, I, and then our co-panelists have ideas on this. But the, the move here is less about uh, structural constraints on private power and more about how do we build in accountability, checks and balances, democracy within the exercise of private or public power. Um, so by way of wrap up then, yep. Uh, uh, let me say a little bit about what the implications of all of this might be. Uh, so that talk mainly theoretically, but I think this is uh, uh, this is helpful to think through both legislatively and administratively what policy design might look like. Um, so if you if you go back and you look at the parts of uh, BB, the BB Build Back Better Bill that didn't pass, right? There were lots of uh, great structural ideas in there that didn't pass, but even those parts, I I would argue, are like not especially like. Uh, optimize for this kind of power shifting, not because folks weren't trying to do so, but I think our actual like imaginary is not yet well developed. Like, if we were to have had a massive investment in care infrastructure, how would we do that in a way that uh, limits against uh, uh, private capture, that expands the long term power of labor and particularly uh, uh, labor in uh, among women of color who are in the care work, right? These are things that uh, groups like the NDWA have been thinking a lot about, but it didn't fully like materialize, I don't think, even in the best versions of the statute that were proposed in the past. Then when it comes to regulation, um, uh, about which uh, I and others can, can say more, but not too much more, uh, 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 I think there's a similar, similar challenge, right? There's uh, some real green shoots in terms of, uh, for example, this administration's approach to empty trust uh, and, and concentration um, uh, on the rulemaking side, uh, which are extremely important. We should talk about those. Uh, but I think even there too, uh, I think a lot remains to be seen about the choice and, for example, industrial policy um, uh, all of these big uh, funding programs are actually going to lead to a structural shift uh, in power, are going to help sort of juice uh, that transformation. Um, so let me maybe stop there because that's 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 plenty, and I want to hear from others. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about a paper that Joel and I are putting together. I'm going to give it off to Joel in a minute. Um, the working title is uh, Industrial Policy and Democratic Practice. Um, so today in Washington, industrial policy is back. Um, the Biden administration is self consciously uh, styling the zero feedback. Here. Um, is that better? Um, so the Biden administration is self-consciously styling the Inflation um, Reduction Act and the Semiconductor Bill and the ARP as, as part of quote industrial strategy. Um, and not only is industrial policy and industrial strategy back, but I think some people see it as the backbone of a new political economic paradigm. Um, so I think this paper begins with our sense that it's not clear what is or could be new about the new industrial policy, um, how it might be organized. Um, whether uh, whether we can or what we would need to do to organize it, not to simply sort of double down on the problems of our current political economy. Um, so in the paper, we'll go to this at some length, but I think in this crowd, I'm not going to say a whole lot about those problems of massive structural inequality that are both racialized and gender, the concentration of corporate power, 
the diminishment of government capacity, right? So how do we do we think about industrial policy against that backdrop? That's really the starting point for this paper. Um, so I think just to say at the outset, clearly industrial policy, in, in my view, and I think in our view, is not all that we need for a new paradigm for political economy. Um, but done in the right way, it could be a component of it. Um, but if it's not done the right way, I think it really does risk simply reproducing or intensifying the problems of existing inequality and concentrated power. So subsidizing private firms while increasing their structural power to dictate the terms of public administration um, and, and disabling forms of caravan power in the economy, uh, in our politics too. So the paper is kind of make a couple of interventions in light of these concerns. So um, first, uh, we're going to put our cards on the table. We do not love the term. Uh, industrial policy. In some ways, I think it's quite problematic, um, but we're going to try to define it in ways that we think makes sense from an LPD perspective. Um, so second, um, we argue that industrial policy never went away in the neoliberal era. Um, it's not even just that it was secret. Um, actually, it took a form, it was sort of an overt industrial policy that took a form that we think we really need to change. Um, third, um, uh, in some ways, I think maybe what we think of as the most important contribution is that we need better ideas about how to administer industrial policy and the right way to do what we call industrial policy is democratic practice. So um, that involves self consciously embrace, embracing democratic values as opposed to sort of narrow conceptions of efficiency at the heart of industrial policy, um, being clearly oriented to intervene in the hierarchical relations of power that constitute the economy. Um, political economy, and more concretely, we'll argue that this means that uh, industrial policy should be aimed at building public power and building counter Um, And so the last part of this paper um, is going to analyze the legal tools and strategies that we have to do this, thinking through, for example, differences between government ownership and contracting um, versus regulation as modalities for exercising and growing public power. Um, and also um, the differences between strategies of power building, counter building, power building, for instance, between, say, sectoral commissions um, or mandatory project labor or community benefits agreements, for example. Okay, so just another note at the outset, another way to understand this project, and this is what I was glad to go after Seville, is as an effort to take the kind of new structuralism in administrative law that people like Seville, but also like Emerson, Nina Khan, Frank Pascal, I think many folks are contributing to and sort of applying it to a very live policy debate because one major question on one political economy circles is how in practice can you publicly govern the political economy in a more democratic fashion? And so this is in a way just a location to work on this question. Okay, so, so a couple of other notes at the outset. So one, um, we're really focused here on how we should administer the new industrial policy and what values it should respond to and how agencies primarily thinking federally but not only um, can operate to implement this vision. Um, so broadly, of course, we think that industrial policy should be established democratically via legislative process, but the new Biden bills leave lots of description um, for agencies. So um, we think also there's certain ways in which the tools of industrial policy are going to be held with a lot of discretion in agencies. And so we have to think about how they exercise that. Um, a second note, okay, so how do we define industrial policy? Let's think about it. Um, so the term industrial policy is subject to many different definitions. Um, our definition of industrial policy is sector-specific policymaking that aims to shape the economy to meet public aims. So some people say all economic policy is industrial policy. Um, and obviously you can see how that argument can be made. Um, but I think that that risks ignoring what may be distinctive about sectoral interventions as a compared to, for example, taxes as a whole or the price system as a whole, right? So we think there's something both sort of somewhat new going on potentially in the new interest in industrial policy and also that there are specific tools like grants and subsidies um, that maybe actually entail particular governance challenges and also opportunities. And so we want to think those through. Um, so we say it's sector specific and not industry specific policy making because otherwise it seems to include care services, governmental sectors, and those are all massively important to our economy. So it makes sense to limit it to industry, actually. This is one of the problems of the term, right? Um, some people also see the purposes of industrial policy as very limited to improving efficiency or productivity or foreign competitiveness. Um, so obviously, um, the whole paper and all of the LPD work seems to me well, to argue against um, So more on that later. Um, but, but broadly, I think um, we're thinking about sector specific policy making to meet public aims. In principle, I think we would rather call that something like developmental strategy, right? That would capture, um, I think, what we're aiming at better. But these are the terms of the public debate. 
seems worthy intervening in that. Um, and also intervening in how particular bills are implemented. Um, okay, so second point that I said we would make, industrial policy did not ever die. Um, it was never gone. Um, I, I think it's, it's useful to see neoliberalism as in certain ways aligned against sectoral approaches to the economy, right? So the sort of idea is magic commensurating power, market signals everywhere are going to flatten everything and so forth. Um, but it also, I think, is really important to see that, again, not just sort of secretly, like, oh, yeah, steel, you know, um, but also overtly, neoliberalism went along with a couple of moves. So state subsidies are not actually cut in this period, particularly in sectors like the tech sector. So government R&D can be described as producing public goods, right? So it's the language that's given to when we should subsidize. Um, but also, firms in the profit mode were allowed to determine more about what those subsidies would really ultimately produce, right? So things like the Bayh-Dole Act come in and sort of say, no conditions on, very few conditions on what can be done with these public subsidies. Let the market remain in terms of the outcomes of these public subsidies and, um, and the oversight also of industries engaged in the So, so the, other, I think the other really important piece of this is that as we privatize functions that belong to the state, there's a, there's a deliberate growing of private sector alternatives. So think about the student loan industry, think about Medicare Advantage, right? Think about the consolidation of defense contracting. These are industrial policy in the neoliberal era. We think it's important to sort of call that out in part because these also contribute to rise of concentrated power and a diminishment of government capacity, which are the kinds of industrial policy we have to work against um, if we're going to actually succeed in, 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 in that in contributing to something more different. So the question then, just then I'm going to hand it off to Joel, is sort of how do we not just repeat and extend this neoliberal version of, of industrial policy and how do we depart from it? Um, uh, the current literature we think doesn't help us much in answering that question, and Joel's going to talk about it. Uh, so why. Thanks, Amy. So um, in this section of the paper, we, we survey a bunch of different literatures that offer frames for structuring administrative decision making as prime industrial policy and otherwise. And we think there's a, there's a major governance gap. Um, in telling us how we get to the kind of industrial policy we want. Um, I'm going to talk about two of these literatures that we surveyed more um, in the paper. So one, we look at efficiency, and we extend LP critiques of efficiency as a kind of star for regulatory decision-making to the industrial policy sphere. You know, even though industrial policy is formally anathema to neoliberal uh, policy makers, there are influential arguments in progressive policy, public policy circles today that we should narrowly calibrate uh, industrial policy subsidies to addressing market failures. That is, that we should um, uh, we should target subsidies to act as the market would through uh, corrected price signals that reflect social externalities, um, no matter how capaciously we, capaciously we define those social externalities. That is, the universal argument would say that just-in-time manufacturing has ensured that we have we don't have enough capacity. Let's let incentivize firms to build it in capacity individually. Um, but we argue instead that industrial policy properly defined reflects developmental goals that are necessarily subjective in nature, that deciding what, what degree and what standards of investment and care infrastructure um, are consistent with social flourishing is a necessarily subjective question that we can decide by measuring and aggregating the individual's willingness to pay for investments in that infrastructure. Um, and it's not only a political question, but one that inevitably requires discretion in um, administrative decision making in, in its execution. Um, so second, we, we evaluate administrative proceduralism as a means for public accountability in the exercise of that discretion. And here we're, we're indebted to the new structuralism um, advanced by folks at Seville and the Gamerson, as, as Amy mentioned. Um, and we share their skepticism of tools that try to advance um, democratic responsiveness by creating formally neutral opportunities for individuals and groups to exercise influence over the regulatory process, whether that's public comment on proposed rulemaking, whether that's an opportunity to file a FOIA request to gain insight into agency deliberations and to, to try to um, get agencies to be more accountable roughly. Um, we see these tools, at least as they're currently configured, as magnifying existing hierarchies of influence over the regulatory process by enabling the most well-resourced parties to, to put up procedural roadblocks that then throttle the agency's ability to act on behalf of a, of a collective public will. But notably, uh, I want to make the point that even, even if this weren't the case, even if you don't accept this, this critique of sort of procedural neutrality, that these mechanisms aren't functionally suited for generating democratic accountability for the kinds of administrative tools that industrial policy would be made for. 
But when we're talking about negotiating loan guarantees or procurement contracts with individual firms, that um, notice and comment on a proposed agency action just isn't a workable model for, for ensuring public input over, over those decisions. And the law that really reflects this, not trying to least, that those that tools that I just described are typically subject to part of the judicial review that's thought of as, as the cornerstone of the administrative law. That said, we think that the, the tension that administrative proceduralism unsuccessfully tries to get at between, on the one hand, developing the specialized expertise needed for administration and reflecting a, a public will for that administration is both especially important and especially a challenging to deal with in the industrial policy context. And that's partly because industrial policy often isn't focused on prescribing private conduct as it is in, say, the financial regulatory space, but about structuring and subsidizing coordination of public and private actors inside technological communities in a way that's necessarily individualized and firm or actor specific. Um, so there are necessarily close interactions between administrators and, and, and private uh, organizations that wish to influence them, which makes the possibility for undue influence particularly acute. But it also means that some of the interventions that we think of, structural uh, interventions that we might think worthwhile in other contexts, whether that's appointing public advocates, uh, deliberative micro public, so you know, participatory budgeting, don't work for the tools of industrial policy decision making again. Um, so this is one of many reasons that we think we've been in paradigm. So in lieu of these two frameworks, we propose that we should we should center democratic industrial policy with the two concepts around building countervailing power and around building public power. I'll talk a bit about the former and then turn back to Amy and Philip for the latter. Um, so by building countervailing power, what we mean is building the power of mass movement organizations to make claims on at once the government administrators of industrial policy and recipients of permanent interests. And this is uh, not just a, you know, an aspiration, but a theory of administration in and of itself, in that it says that agencies should adopt rules and use, the, use their discretion at the margin of deciding how to be honest in ways that um, enable mass business organizations to build organization capacity, capacity that they can then use to exercise influence across these developmental networks. So I can briefly, briefly sketch them. So using that countervailing category over public administration would be structured input over how agency leaders set high level development rules that give voice to the distributive consequences of choosing between potential technological frontiers and deciding where to allocate resources. And exercising that countervailing power over the recipients of industrial policy support means giving organizations leverage to negotiate co-determination production at the, at the sites of industrial policy largesse and community benefits agreements that benefit other stakeholders. And it also means generating upside for those movement groups to engage in monitoring and enforcement of the terms of public support. Um, so, so two kind of points on countervailing power. One is that we see a key goal of building countervailing power as building mass movement, the great mass movement organizations into the epistemic communities that define what constitutes success for industrial policy programs. Uh, we, we see this as key to moving industrial policy from a narrow conception of um, meaning technological objectives. You know, what do we need to, to achieve the highest yield and green hydrogen development to targeting larger human development goals? Um, and a final point I want to note is that our, our, um, our focus is on tools of uh, executive administration that can build government power, but we don't see these interventions as limited to that sphere. We see them as um, enabling popular influence over the democratic process in both legislative and other spheres of political and economic life. Um, and we're particularly interested in how building capacity for that, those sorts of mobilizations can result in policy feedback loops that in turn generate the political supports for agencies needed for them to exercise public power over the, the recipients of industrial policy support. And then I'll turn back to Amy on that. Luke is going to give me one more minute, I think. Um, I want to get to our time just to say a little bit about the public power component. Um, we're, we use the term public power and not state power because we actually want to embed within this. There's a tension at the heart, sort of building power, which the power has to be accountable also to these democratic public formations, right? So we want to build public power um, and that um, that is going to be able to be subordinated to the popular will, right? Um, but we want to, so we're also going to talk about industrial policy building public power in three specific aspects. So public, sort of building public information, knowledge, and control. And so those are going to sort of track different kinds of techniques of uh, our sort of policy tools. 
Um, and so, you know, so public information clearly is important to industrial policy. If you want to achieve public goals, you need to have good information about um, the political economy. And so we'll be thinking here about tools that the government has, some of which it still has and some of which were really degraded during the, um, the last many decades, but powers like subpoena government agencies to build uh, information about the private sector and, and, and barriers to this and secret law that actually inhibit the um, uh, gathering information about the economy. Um, government also needs knowledge, so the kinds of higher level skills, understanding, and embedded know-how. And so we're going to be thinking there about government employment and the importance of government employment and um, um, bringing more capacity and expertise internal to, to government. Um, and then government control. And here we're going to be thinking about the government's capacity to, in fact, um, enforce the terms of contractual agreements, insist on public priorities like curtailing price gouging, um, ensuring uh, that technologies evolve in the direction of the public wishes, um, mandating collaboration, all of these that require kinds of coercive public authority um, and, um, and thinking of seeing Lenore over here. So this is a conversation that she and others have helped to start on some guardrails around industrial policy um, that we want to um, uh, sort of draw on and elaborate the tools that are then necessary to do that. Uh, so we have a stop there and then we're going to Thank you so much. Thank you to Sanjay, Ren Raul, and the other organizers for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be here because I'm truly energized by the discussion of all folks in the audience, as well as my fellow panelists. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about a chapter in my forthcoming book, Entitled Democracy and Power, or this chapter is entitled Grassroots Democracies and Question Mark. And it is based on a mix of primary and secondary research. And I should mention that a number of cooperative and public power officials and organizers and generally uh, generously uh, took the time to talk with me on that one about their experiences with these institutions across the country. Uh, so I should provide some context for digging into the uh, specifics of the chapter. So in the United States today, around 72% of residential electricity customers are served by investor-owned utilities. I looked this up before coming here here in Boston, the uh, investor of utility we have we call Eversource in uh, DC. They're served by an investor of utility called Pepco. These are shareholder dominated corporations that are subject to regulation at the state level by the public service commissions, as well as the federal level by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Typically, states regulate the retail side, while the federal government so, of operations. What about the other 28% of Americans? Uh, so they are actually served by cooperative and publicly owned utilities. Residents of the city of Los Angeles, Seattle, and Austin, among others, are served by municipal owned utilities. In Nebraska, among the reddest states in the country, all residents are served by either cooperative and publicly owned utilities. Which raises the question, where do these community controlled utilities come from in the first place? As with many other progressive institutions in the United States, they originated during the New Deal. And at the time, the power industry was dominated by large holding companies or were its critics, the power trust. They often control a loose network of utility systems scattered across the country. They made they granted extraordinary wealth on and power on their controlling shareholders and promoters, but failed to serve the public. And I'll highlight two facts. In 1935, only about one in 10 farmers in the United States had electric service. So 90% of Americans residing in the countryside did not have electric service. And even in cities where most people did have electricity, they had rather limited electric service. They had enough current to have uh, light fixtures, maybe a radio, but not enough current to have heavier appliances such as washing machines and refrigerators. And the aim of progressives at the time was to provide electric modernization for everyone, regardless of whether they lived in cities or in rural areas. And the New Deal, among other things, fundamentally restructured the power center in the United States. And it really did so through three specific means. First, and most famously, it established institutions such as the Tennessee Valley Authority and Bonneville Power Administration to build multi-purpose dams, I think of the Grand Coulee Dam, the Shasta Dam in Northern California, they improve navigation, they provide flood control, and 
also generated and burned in large quantities of electricity. Second, the new dealers reconstructed and cut down the size of holding companies that dominated the power sectors, the Public Utility Holding Company Act of 1955. And then last but not least, the federal government provided financial and technical aid for cooperative and publicly owned utilities, principally for the role of rural electrification administration, which provided credit, low cost credit to rural electrification projects, and also the public works administration that provided a mix of grants and loans for municipally owned power systems. And the project to provide electric modernization for all Americans was phenomenally successful. So as I mentioned in 1935, only about one in 10 farmers had electricity. By 1953, this figure had risen to almost nine in 10. So in less than 20 years, also during a global conflict in which the entire economy is put on your footing, the United States successfully electrified and decided. But the New Dealers aimed to do more. It was not simply about electric modernization. They tried to establish public control over the sector, rather by improving public utility regulation at the federal and state level, and also by setting up utilities, you know, communities and co-ops directly controlled by their communities. And one of the TBA's early uh, chairman, David William Ball, um, articulated it, uh, an ideology informing union power policy in a 1944 book called Democracy in the March. Now, Lillian Dahl said that the principle of grassroots democracy defined the TBA system. He said that residents of the Tennessee Valley were the ones making the important decisions, and people like him, federal administrators, were simply providing technical assistance for them to carry on their social plans. Further, he said the rural electric cooperatives and municipal utilities that purchased free sold power from the TBA also embodied grassroots democracy. They were truly controlled by their communities and the William Dahl's view. Which raises the question, have these institutions lived up to the ideology of grassroots democracy that you articulated in 1944? And the answer is somewhat sad, unsatisfying. Some of them have some of the time. I'm going to focus on a couple of happy examples and a couple of not so happy examples. So the first positive example is the Roanoke Electric Cooperative that serves an agrarian part of Northeastern North Carolina. The community it serves is majority black. And it now has a majority black board, thanks to decades of organizing rights and strong members. And notably, of the more than 900 electric cooperatives in the United States, it's only one of three that has a black CEO. And that fact alone should give us some pause because these electric cooperatives are heavily concentrated in the southern United States. Dozens of them serve the majority of plurality of black communities. And in spite of that, it's only a minuscule fraction of these community controlled institutions have. Black leaders by the time. So, has done a number of positive things during the course of the COVID 19 pandemic, still ongoing COVID 19 pandemic. It shifted to virtual annual meetings, it allowed for online voting to ensure that members can continue to participate in annual elections and co op decision making. It's also pioneered a number of demand response projects to, to even out the valleys, the peaks and valleys that are the bay that you've had electric utilities existence. It's also trying to promote the adoption of electric vehicles as a way of monitoring some of these ships in the electric time. Another positive example is Nine Star Connect. That's that's an electric cooperative that serves suburban and rural areas near Indianapolis. Uh, it's a model of democratic governance in a number of ways. For example, the board does not play favorites between incumbent board members and challengers. Most board seats are contested. The board offers limited support for all candidates. It has quarterly meetings on strategic planning, as well as more prosaic in publishing appliances and electronic devices for members. It also runs the Leadership Academy to train members interested in learning about co-op operations and potentially running board seats in the future. Uh, but unfortunately, these two cooperatives are not necessarily representative of all electric cooperatives. Other electric cooperatives have been played by self perpetuating boards, corruption among board members, Capacity around co op operations. For instance, many co ops have built up large surpluses uh, over time and instead of re returning them to co op members in the form of credits or refunds, they've held on to them. In fact, Jim, uh, former Congressman Jim Cooper, said that 
Uh, Earl Andrew Faulkner is one of the largest law schools in capital in America. He wrote an article in the Harvard Journal of Legislation in 2008, calling out but the problem is failure to turn their surpluses to members. Um, I'll highlight a couple of uh, bad co-ops. Uh, so the Rappahannock Electric Cooperative near Washington, D.C. Is, is an example of a co-op that's been defined by self interesting boards. The board has used a proxy voting system to manipulate elections. Uh, it has often used proxies to allow favored members, uh, favored candidates to beat uh, candidates who actually won or votes from the actual voting public. It's, it's been especially hostile toward contest, uh, contestants who raise the issue about climate change and what the co op is doing about reducing its carbon footprint. Uh, another cooperative that is actually being called out is Black Warrior in northern Alabama. This is a co op that didn't have a single election between 1950 and 2016 because its annual meetings did not perform. And as such, the board said, we don't have enough. Member of the president, therefore, we're not going to have an election. The incumbent board gets to serve another term. Pretty nice deal in the uh, But then, in, in Berkeley, there have been some revolts at these undemocratic co ops in recent times. And so, in Texas, at the Heard Analysis Electric Cooperative, which President Lyndon Johnson helped form in the 1930s, members rose up in 2007 and threw out the incumbent board and the trade. The board and management had been enriching themselves at the expense of the institution. For example, Bud Burnett who served as the coordinator of the board and admitted he knew very little about the co-ops operations. Had been paid more than a million dollars between 2001 and 2007. Um, this abuse was exposed through intrepid journalism as well as lawsuits uh, and board uh, and co-op became much more democratic subsequently. There was a similar revolt in. South Carolina cooperative by the name of Tri County in 2017, where board members were using their privileges, uh, basically engaging in self dealing. Uh, so I will, okay, next. <laughs> uh, so let's see here. Uh, so there are a couple of facts I want to highlight about Tri County. Uh, so Tri County was plagued by the abuse of per diem policies. So the board members got to pay themselves $500 for every day that they conducted cooperative business. And oftentimes they hold sham meetings just to collect these five hundred dollars. And it turned out one of the board members actually came to Purdy in for February 30th, which is we know. <laughs> uh, but just like Purdy Alice a decade earlier, members rose up in the summer of 2018, threw out the incumbent board and voted in a much more representative board. Until 2018, the board was all white despite serving a multiracial community. Now that's much more represented before. So, why has cooperative governance been so uneven over time? I think one important reason is deficient in cooperative law. So, when these institutions were set up in the 1930s and 40s, most states did not have laws specifically for electric cooperatives. They had laws for farm cooperatives and consumer cooperatives in general, but they didn't account for the Specific uh, requirements of electric cooperatives, notably the need to serve exclusive territories, unlike farm cooperatives, electric cooperatives are typically run at a monopoly for a particular territory. And to account for this efficiency in the law, the Rural Electrification Administration published a series of model statutes in the 1930s just to get these institutions up and running. And looking at these laws, what is really struck by their spartans, they're one or two page documents. They, they say very little about governance. They say these co-ops should hold an annual meeting, have an annual election. They don't, there are no real consequences. Uh, they, say, they say nothing else about public participation. Effectively say that, well, members get to engage at the annual meeting, that, that's sufficient. I, I understand why the law is so sparse. The New Dealer defense set, set these institutions up very quickly in the face of threats from industrial utilities that want to suffocate them in the cradle, as well as allies and state public service commissions that didn't move these institutions very favorably. So they were trying to get these institutions off and running, get rural America, rural America electrified. They weren't necessarily setting these institutions up with an aim toward long-term democracy. So the practical consequence is the law left uh, gave incorporators and laws extraordinary discretion not to follow the bare minimum of democratic control. As a result, co-op incorporators can make important decisions on governance and bylaws. And for instance, know that even if they didn't hold any meetings for elections, they would not fund the law of government institution. Further, the law allows 
prompts to use things like proxy voting and many core requirements that prevent democratic and democratic control. It didn't mandate undemocratic law, rather allowed for extraordinary discretion. And so I think that's one reason we see a great deal of variation. We see that co-ops that are quite democratic in practice than others that are profoundly undemocratic. And I'll conclude by saying the law can play an important role here. It can establish more corporate governance by establishing election procedures, requiring things like monthly board meetings that are public and mandating publication of financial statements. Now, I should qualify that by saying I don't think law is sufficient for electric cooperatives to comply with the of democracy that requires organizing and mobilization. And in the short term, not, law may not even be necessary. I offer a couple of examples of cooperatives that are quite democratic in practice, even though the relevant laws are not particularly strong. But I submit that in the long run, if you want durable cooperative democracy, good law is essential, necessary, but not sufficient. All right, thank you to the panelists. I'm now going to ask one question, which is really sort of a broad question with some sub questions. And we'll go, we'll do one round robin and then we'll open it up for discussion. Um, so, one of the central pillars that Amy and Joel posit for more democratic industrial policy is the expansion of public capacity. And they say they don't just mean government capacity, but the capacity they have in mind is that of the federal government. And indeed, uh, part of the expansion of public capacity they have in mind is the ability to effectively control the private sector. On the other hand, Sandeep's focus is on how to make private entities more democratic by structuring their ownership and governance in a way that engages those they serve. Both of these, I think, are structuralist approaches in Sabil's sense, and both are focused on making processes more democratic in service of substantively just outcomes. But they defer in where they locate the relevant administration and perhaps how important the public private fund is. So my question is basically, how do you respond to that, each panelist? But let me just provide a more a couple more specific possible questions, uh, which maybe can be picked up later. Um, how important is it to draw a line between public and private and thinking about democratizing administration and social provisioning? And does that line track state, non-state, or is there something else that it tracks? And however you answer the conceptual question, does democratization at the firm level change how we think about what democratization at the federal administrative level should look like? If firms themselves are already less pulled by the problem voter, for instance, should we be less concerned as to whether they capture the regulatory process in question? So let's just go. Why don't we start with some deep your discussion? Sure. So I think the public private question is an important one. It's, it's not a binary, it exists along the continuum. And cooperatives have really exploited their dual nature, uh, I should say, cooperative boards and management. So in most states, cooperatives are not subject to regulation by the Public Service Commission, they are not subject to income tax. And the official story is well controlled by the community, we should be treated differently than investor utilities that answer so principally with their shareholders. So, when they're trying to avoid regulation, when they're trying to prevent uh, measures that would tax them, they say we are public, we're public, we're community controlled. Uh, but legally, they're, they're private institutions. Yeah. Community members stand in the place of shareholders. They vote for the board, they vote on important policy questions, they're entitled to the institution surplus. And so they take advantage of this dual character. So when court members make demands on them, for example, they say, they'll say, why don't you comply with state public meeting laws? Why don't you tell us how much the CEO was paid last year? Cops will say, well, we're actually private institutions. We are under no legal obligation to share information with you. In fact, some court managers have said, but they were deeply offended that people asked how much they were. How much they were <laughs> and so this project has actually made me somewhat skeptical about the electric cooperative model. I think it, it straddles this public private divide. You know, I mentioned it's a continuum, it sort of exists at the midpoint. And if we care about building a truly publicly accountable sector, we should be talking more about public, 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 codifying democratic best practice and viewing these institutions not as part private, part public, but as fully public. So I think going forward, at least in this sector, public power is the right model of quantitative power. 
Great. Um, so that's a great question. Uh, I guess I have two big thoughts about it. Uh, one is conceptual and the other is uh, practical. So I think that conceptually, um, so I, I mean, I think we would all agree that sort of public private distinction, right? It's not the, necessarily like uh, has a ton of purpose, but uh, the way I think about it is, you know, what we're really, as a normative concept of democracy, what we're really after is um, both like the affirmative idea of democratic agency for individuals and communities, but also the negative idea of uh, protection against domination. That is the, um, the concentration of unaccountable power. That power could be public nominally, that power could be private nominally, kind of doesn't matter. The point is that power is power. Sometimes it weighs, wears a public guy, sometimes it wears a private guy. Either way, from a normative standpoint, that's a hostile to democracy. And so viewed that way, it's almost more of a sliding scale, right? The more power you have, the more I would either want to break up your power, therefore making you less threatening, and, and then you can be private for all I care if you like, but you have the realm, the realm of people you can destroy with your limited private power strings, so I'm less worried about your private power. The more power you, but the more you want to retain that concentration of power, the more public it needs to be. Um, and so like one of the, um, uh, this is a little bit outside my area of, of deep knowledge, but one thing that always fascinates me is when company, in the stock market, when companies go public, Right. I mean, in practical terms, that, that doesn't mean anything of the kind. But it's always like struck me. It's like, yeah, like of course, when a company rises above a certain value, so of course it should go public in a literal sense. Then it's going to be more like directly tied to public modes of accountability and public obligations. So of course that makes sense to me as a normative matter, right? So so normatively, I think the question is who has power of what kind and what is the sort of uh, assemblage of checks and balances that you might have impose, some of which might be structural constraints on that power, or as an alternative uh, democratic participation within the exercise of that power. Um, and then the practical thing, uh, I think, um, Luke, your question sort of raises this question, uh, I get like, you know, where, where in, where do you, do we uh, uh, target a democratic intervention, democratizing intervention, sort of at the commanding heights of, you know, uh, the implementation of the IRA, say, or at the local level? And I think uh, there it's a tension between um, one in the ideal you want democratizing uh, interventions to uh, situate at the look at the locus of where the power really resides. And so, um, you know, in the paper Dustin and I wrote a couple of years ago, we talked about this as, as situating democratization upstream rather than downstream. Meaning, it should really it really matters if communities have power at a point in the decision making process where they really can influence and shape meaningful outcomes and it, it, it's it's a lot it's a lot less power if you only get to like fight over the problems that are left over right um so that's the goal but i also think if we're thinking strategically there would be times where you actually would want to lean on uh, democratizing reforms that are more at a, a downstream level because it's a way of bootstrap right because we think that that will those democratizing wins will help generate and catalyze the kind of movement building that Joel and Amy talked about, which will then in turn help build power that can claim more forms of democratization sort of later down the line. So I think it's a tactical question as much as a conceptual one. Yeah, I agree with what's been said. Um, I think maybe a useful entry point for thinking about um, this question in another policy context is to say, it's asked what our sort of, what our, our telos or political horizon is. And I think it's not, um, uh, sort of a universal deliver democratic deliberative model from, of a command and control style regulation about where we should allocate resources. I think we're we're interested in um, both public and you know other semi autonomous spheres of allocation, and we see democratizing interventions as as um, being occurring through the administrative state. That is the that is the fulcrum through which we we exercise them but operating not just on the public sphere, but also on those other semi autonomous spheres. And if you look at the industrial policy literature, I mean, folks like sociologists like Fred Block have made the point that often industrial policy isn't just about subsidy, it's about sort of structural coordination inside these communities. It's about creating um, shared technological standards or intellectual property platforms, or about acting as matchmakers between incumbent and startup firms. And if that's the, if that's the nature of state intervention in those semi autonomous spheres, we should do so in a way that's um, um, targeted towards not only um, reducing concentrated interest of private power, but creating sort of material conditions for, for economic equality to enable democratic decision making in those spheres and also uh, emanating from them. Um, so, bringing up the, the rear here, um, so the, one way to think about this is that 
Um, you know, maybe uh, I think I'm less attracted to the idea of a sort of continuum between public and private than maybe sort of being more precise by what we mean by public and private. And one of the one of the people that we talk about in the paper in what's my thinking on this is Elizabeth Anderson in private government, who uh, defines public in a way that doesn't track government versus market, right? But says, you know, what when something is public, it means that that, that people are able to assert standings to make claims regarding its governance. And make collective decisions regarding it and hold accountable those um, who are making those decisions, right? And so this is part of how she constructs the idea of there being um, private governance, but also the possibility of public governance in the workplace, right? Um, and also, I think very importantly, here I also think about somebody like Sheldon Rowland, who says, like, the state is not synonymous with the public either. The state can be taken over by a certain part of your story about what it is, too, right? To be taken over and utterly unaccountable. And we need to grapple with that, too. And so the, the publicness of the state itself is always a contingent achievement, right? So, so if you view it that way, then I think you've got embedded a sort of way of thinking about public and private still retains a conceptual distinction between them. And I think and maybe the, the, the second thing I would say about that is I still do think it's important to also talk about differences between how we organize government and how we organize firms in their relative openness to publicness, right? So the ability to try to take them over to their sort of a sensible legitimacy and accountability to being taken over by the public, to being having democratic demands made upon it, um, and the legitimacy and, and, and tech, sort of techniques um, of organization that we use that limit who can participate and the grounds under which something can be claimed to be legitimate. And so in that sense, I do think there still remains an important distinction between government and, and firms. Cooperatives blend in this interesting way that you, right? Um, in terms of how they're organized and what the narratives around them are that make one more public in the sense that Anderson talks about. Um, uh, uh, and so it would make, would make the state a really important um, uh, site for us to claim um, and build democratic forces. Uh, but to say, and this is why the whole and sort of idea of fugitive democracy that the state itself, uh, the government itself is a site of democracy, is very much a contingent fact and has to be constantly reproduced before it won't exist. So. There's an element there, so the kind of looks this part out there. Some people have. I really like the community, so the position on the public versus private that she takes off or correct it. I didn't mean public. Versus private in the conventional sense that we have public law and then other areas that are private law. I was thinking more along the lines of who gets to exercise discretion. And the institutional economist Horace Gray was very critical of public utility regulation in the United States because he said, yes, the state is asserting control over certain aspects of utility business, but it's still allowing managers and shareholders to exercise great discretion over some fundamental aspects of their business. So basically, State got to set a few variables, but then managers and financiers got to set other variables. And an interesting illustration of this problem is that it's a gas and electric, uh, pretty notorious utility. If you look at their record on decarbonization, it's actually pretty good because the state of California has said you need to decarbonize on this time frame. And they've actually slightly exceeded the targets that the state set for them. But it's, at the same time, the state has said, well, we will let you figure out how to maintain and manage brush and trees around the power lines. Mm -hmm. And they use that discretion to prioritize stock buybacks and paying out dividends instead of maintaining the power lines safely, making necessary upgrades, and cutting down trees when appropriate, and consequences of that discretion have been devastating for the people of California. So I've got one, two, three, and then we'll do another one. Great. Uh, Sharon Block, Harvard Law School. And my question is, I guess, primarily for my good friend, Sabiel, but happy to hear what anybody else thinks. So, Sabiel, something that we've worked on together is the intersection of a different structuralism. So, the structure of the administrative state and the government and how it impedes the kind of new structuralism that you would like to see come into being. The two examples, obviously, closest to my heart are Alira, the fact that we create this formal structure to question or contest when the government is exercising power, but no complementary system when the government fails to exercise power. And then Department of Labor, which suggests that 
the interest of workers and their power is limited to a narrow sphere of actors. Nobody else, Department of Transportation, doesn't have to care about how their policy impacts workers. Um, I just wonder what you think and what you saw in your experience in the federal government uh, about how maybe we can we can uh, undo that um, that impediment. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hold my hand. Yeah, let's go questions. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about um, public power, countervailing public power um, through mass movement organizations. There's an alternative side from democratization. Um, there's alternative things like public comments and participatory uh, budgeting. Uh, some of the questions that come to mind are like, who, as a general principle, should decide which mass movement organizations are at the table for given decision or project. And also, on what basis should the decision be made? How we balance the breadth of the constituency that an organization might be speaking for with the need to represent particular marginalized and vulnerable constituencies? Um, and also, how, how important and how should we measure internal democracies within those organizations as well to make sure they're actually representing the constituencies that they're supposed to be speaking for? So, thanks to all of you. I thought that was really amazing how synergistic it was. Um, I understand how you guys did that, but um, I took a couple of comments for Amy and Joel. Right? The first, I love it. I love the sector specific deconceptualization of industrial policy. I guess for it. Just one comment, which I think leads to another. So, Joel, when you were discussing nicely the sort of limits of the economic cost benefit theory of administrative law, right? Sort of said, uh, inevitably, the decisions will not just be cost benefit, but subjective and discretionary. So I just want to, you know, just suggest and push back on the idea that, of course, cost benefit is itself a value choice, right? And so, so I want to push back on the idea that cost benefit isn't a value choice, but I want to more push back on the idea that value choices are subjective, which is a weird thing for me to say, but I want to push back on this. I think I want to push back on the whole idea that value choices are subjective, and if the alternative is that they're objective. Because that whole frame, this frame of modernity that we inherited, leads to sort of cost benefit analysis, right? Because it's subjectivism run amok. What can you do in a world of subjectivism except to put everyone's subjective preference aggregated somehow, right? That's the modern episteme. And I think, you know, we have to sort of say, no, values are neither subjective nor objective. They're inherently social. They're to be articulated and accountable to others. And, you know, Amy, just to pick up on a comment we made in our last session, right? Jan Elster, rooting in, the, in Rousseau, points out that when you enter a democratic space, you have to make an argument in the public interest. That's what democratic arguments are, in the public interest. So I don't think we should totally buy into the pure proceduralism that's involved in countering efficiency with democracy only. I don't think we should be, I mean, you know, you mentioned flourishing, uh, Luke mentioned substantively just. I think there's gotta be a space in LPD for articulating some substantive notions of equity and flourishing as well and not always only finding the answer in democratic process. It's a tension, I think. I think it's an important tension, but I just think, you know, and a part of the problem is the sort of fear we all have that values are subjective. Of course, they're not objective, but they've got to be articulated publicly and socially in an accountable dynamic. And democracy itself is a theory, and there's different theories of it, and we've got to admit to that to some extent, I think. But I, think I mean, I love that. I'm sort of saying, you know, I think one tension is, you gotta sometimes be able to talk about equity and what we mean by flourishing as one of the inputs to the democratic process of public interest. So why don't we so severely you were asked a direct question and then uh Amy and Joel when we respond and then severely you can pick up what you like to yeah. Uh yeah, that's great. Well, well, um uh, I, I can I can ping the question back to you. So no, no, it, this, so this is great. Um uh, uh and and I do have thoughts on this. So so I think um uh, without getting too into the weeds of sort of like all the ins and outs of uh documents that may or may not be floating, things that, that have been published that may be published and so forth. Um I think there are a couple of things that I think is actually uh, really fascinating about this administration. Um, you know, about president, even accepting the efforts of, of uh, president company. Um, so, uh, say a couple of things. One is that I think uh, uh, there's a process that has started, but that is only just in its infancy of socializing and acculturating 
the federal administrative state to the kinds of ideas that, for example, Amy and Joe were talking about, or it's like the kind of uh, excavation that Sandeep was just doing, right? This idea that part of your job as a federal agency is not just to design a program in a way that like skirts past arbitrary and capricious review and meets the sort of like internalized constraints of uh, kind of conventional cost benefit analysis, but to design policy that is power shifting and structural in advance of a particular notion, uh, not super thin, but not super thin necessarily of, uh, of a substantively uh, egalitarian inclusive democratic uh, political economy. And so if you look at like the work that agencies have started to do under the president's uh, equity executive order, for example, like they started to develop you know, equity action plans, they start to develop a language around equity, uh, they start to develop systems for collecting the kind of data that Amy and Joel talked about. So I think all that is really good, right? It's that capacity building, muscle building, socialized, a different imagining for the administrative state, completely independent of doctrine, right? It's about day-to-day -day public administration. So I love that. Um, uh, then I think there's uh, specific programs that are like the kind of potential bootstrapping, you know, catalytic examples. So um, you know, the debate over uh, the, the first CHIPS a notice of funding opportunity that um, had to do with semiconductor plants uh, and some of the big flows of money included a provision that applicants have to um, provide for affordable, high quality childcare uh, for the workers in those plants. This occasion, like a mini Tempest in Kipa, for a positive, like I, I was learning about this, so of others. Um, but it's like fascinating, right? As they like break in the ice of a new way of thinking about what really should be completely straightforward, you know, right? But but then you, know, you have like the Jason Furman's of the world freaking out about it. And so that's fine. <laughs> uh, so, so specific programs that bootstrap us towards it. Um, and then I do think there's like a universe where we need to think about very different administrative structures. So like, you know, I love this idea uh, in Representative Jai Paul's bill of like, should it be an office of the public advocate embedded in OMB, whose job is to do like fill the gap that you were talking about, Sharon. I mean, you can imagine very different sort of interagency process uh, uh, and so forth. I, um, I'll, I'll stop talking because I have other thoughts on Osita and Tal's question, but I'll let Alex stop. Feel free to call on other Neil that says you can. Just briefly, maybe to try to bridge between Tal's question and your question, I guess I think um, I I do agree, Tal, with your point about claiming um, claiming a positive set of values in the process and that aren't procedural in a democratic sense. So you and I have talked about this privately, but I think we need to think about when we, when we use the term democracy, not thinking democracy as a process for aggregating preferences, but democracy is an order of political equality that is itself contingent upon a certain kind of material order where and a certain social order, right? I mean, Domination being an important principle, but also relative degrees of material equality. Um, uh, so, so I think we need to actually be precise about how we're talking about democracy and, and thinking about it, building it from a material, um, from a material base. Um, and I think also, in fact, um, laying claim to these positive values as we're talking about what it means to build a sort of democratic industrial policy. It is not one that simply says, if I notice a comment to make your, you know, everyone makes your claim, um, but that would try to be this power building thing. And I appreciate your question there, because I think one one way that, well, one of the things we're trying to bridge in this, and we've got this kind of contrast when you're doing 15 version of it, but is between the sort of work that the, I think the labor papers, we think about, um, uh, ben Sachs and Dave Anderson's piece about sort of building countervailing power and the importance of mass movement organizations in translating power into politics and projecting power into politics. So the, the particular importance of mass movement organizations in that context, but we're also trying to keep in the story consistent with our conception of sort of democracy as a political or a, a sort of a system of policies premised on equality, historic forms of disadvantage and subordination. So that you also need particular forms of attention to and power building in and among communities that have historically been marginalized. And think about how industrial policy has screwed communities of color um, and women and like experience we've written all over that history. So that is something that you need to invert very mindfully. And I think sort of trying to sort of but putting those two together is some of what we have in mind, right? So that that's going to be best done. Um, if we think of this not just as sort of individual level interventions, but in fact, how we're building that can project power into politics. Um, but, you know, exactly how that's going to be done. I mean, to some degree, our paper is meant to sort of uh, structure our thinking about this, which will, will always be difficult to sort of apply in practice, sort of how you hold all these things together in practice. But having a different architecture and language for what we're even trying to accomplish 
So I think what Seville is also pointing to, to me, would be your real difference. It's sort of what we would come to, even if we're not, we don't prescribe the recipe for exactly how you make all these things line up. They won't always line up their attentions, I think, sometimes. We'll see. And on the, um, the narrow, but really important question you raised about how do you bring uh, specific mass movement organizations structurally into regulatory decision making and in the process decide who is best equipped to represent the interests of the environmental movement and the labor movement? And this is this is a question that's been um, discussed at nauseum in the, in the in the labor law context. Um, and it's all the more difficult in the spheres of civil society where we have even less, less you know, lower levels of organization than there. Um, so three sort of quick off the bat thoughts. So I think one thing we're interested in is how we how the state can set right line structural rules to try to bring movement organizations into decision making while delighting that question of deciding who is the best representative the environment of the movement. So you can do things like saying, like uh, we're going to preference firms to receive a subsidy if they have community that if they've signed community benefits agreements with community groups representing X number of people or Y percentage of people as a you know for, for working in the metropolitan area. So you're not making a governmental judgment about whether X community group is actually you know greenwashed and is a like a, a function of itself of the, the organization that's trying to, to build a project that is trying to draw up community support, but you rely on some other other metrics. Um, a second thought is you know we already have um, competitive procedures for deciding what sorts of institutions are best equipped to fulfill the state's needs when it comes to procurement or, or grant making other stuff. They're, they're definitely uh, half-baked and unsuccessful in all sorts of ways, but we could have, you know, we could apply the same sorts of um, uh, decision-making criteria to deciding um, what sorts of organizations are best equipped to, uh, to train workers to enter into the workforce in a given technological sector, rather than giving subsidies to firms saying you need to form sectoral partnerships with labor organizations, say, let's have different organizations that compete to uh, see who's most successful at landing um, workers in, in, in stable, high quality jobs and give subsidies on that side of the equation rather than to the capital staff, to, to labor organizations. And the third is sort of use the political process as a means to, 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 um, to answering that question. You know, as of, as of 2023, it's still constitutional to have a multi member commission where you say the president shall appoint a member um, from, you know, rep who represents X community or of a, you know, of a list proposed from list proposed by environmental groups. You know, whether that would still be constitutional in, in five years is, is hard to know. But you, know, you can use that um, that process as a way to sort of gen create a political fulcrum for contestation between those groups about who's best equipped to represent um, the, the interests of a particular community and let that play out in public rather than have it make it be exclusively a decision. Dude, I saw for a couple of thousand now. Talk more about firm side and things. I think we should think more about having institutions and elected boards. So I didn't go into any great depth about the Tennessee Valley Authority. Believe it or not, it's not been a model of the grassroots democracy. It's been very much a top down institution from the beginning with the administrators, originally board of three, now board of nine, making decisions often uh, against the wishes of people in region it served. And uh, a climate justice group called the uh, Community and Climate Project put out an interesting report this week called Building Public Renewables, in which they reimagined institutions like the TPA and said, why don't we actually have elected boards? We can have boards that represent different constituencies. We can have a portion of the board, maybe a majority that's elected by the community, uh, another portion of the board that's elected by the workers at the institution, maybe third segment that's appointed by the governor or the president. And in an industry like power, there's this constant tension between community control, popular participation, and the need for expertise. I've been looking at the power, studying the power sector for many years, but I'm a lawyer. I still don't really understand the physics of electric power systems. And that's often used as a defense of the status quo. We need experts running things. But this might actually be another case for co determination arrangements where you have workers at the relevant utility, people who know the ins and outs of the business, serving on the board, obviously advancing principles of economic democracy, but also giving the board important expertise that it would otherwise lack. I think we have a good few more minutes to um, go to the round of questions. Lenora? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. 
so thank you. This was amazing. I love it. You know, it's amazing. All of you together. The synergies are really, really nice. So I have two at this point, and part of these are points that I know how long to be on. So I'm going to inspect uh, fully on that. Um, so I'm, I think that's a familiar conception of policy design. I think it's really uh, fascinating to hear So I think. It's interesting to think about your first element of policy design, design approach, um, you know, in terms of uh, dealing with concentrated corporate power. And I worry that we're dealing too much with the concentrated part and not with power. And what I mean by that is I think that um, we actually need to, if we're thinking big picture about policy design, focus on the type of market structures that we actually want, which are going to be sectorally specific, not the same in all sectors. Which may mean we want regulated all documents in certain sectors. Um, and I think that you know you can't just sort of fall back anymore on a break them up approach that is applicable in certain sectors and in certain um, sectors and not in others. And so thinking about that. And, and this is a, uh, there was a great conference yesterday actually about uh, antitrust and worker C and and leading um, labor union policy folks. And so there's I think a like movement where we can push this conversation forward. Um, I would love to see you meet up. And then, you know, eight years old, and I love this paper so much. And, like, there's so much to think about. Um, you know, I think the, the point about administrative decisions is that we're not looking for loans and grants is super important when you're you know, playing out in your time. And so I just wanted to bring up so it's one um, piece of work that, that I'm thinking about right now is on public equity stakes. And so thinking about how could those be a uh, structure in which they sort of provide the ongoing public engagement and accountability in the process of corporate governance, not only in the moment of making the terms of the loan or the grant, but also in the process of production and decision making going forward. So that's a specific tool that could, I think, be interesting to include the like, a counterpoint is something that we don't need to really can't administrate it, uh, you know, for people who are really in this process. What can we do that would be much better? Let me just leave the floor open. Does anyone else want to hop in? I don't think I'm going to subject myself to more of my questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I got a text message from one of the folks following on Zoom. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, friend of the show, Dominic Powell asks Theris uh, <laughs> Paul has argued that American civic life itself has become increasingly oligarchic since mid-century. How do we deal with the anti-democratic tendencies within social movements and avoid essentializing them as we simultaneously seek to incorporate them into governance? Okay, so now uh, let's start with Amy and Joel and go to Sandeep and then Sabine. Um, great, um, I think I'll limit myself to speaking to the Norse point. Um, so that we're not all speaking on every point. Um, I'm I'm very excited that you're working on public equity. It's something I'm also very interested in, and I think that's what we hope that the last section of the paper will really start to do, like on the public power side, is is sort of try to think about it in a structured way. Like, what is the difference between the government exercising authority as a regulator, as a contractor, as an owner, um, as a part owner? Um, because I think you can start to see that we need a better language for thinking about that. One one example uh, uh, in the way that I've been thinking about it is that. When we were sitting in the middle of a COVID pandemic, right, and we needed companies to start making different things, um, we did have the Defense Production Act, which is actually really powerful for regulation that I don't, like, my maybe was didn't know anything about it before. Um, but um, but I do think that that was different than had the government, and I can tell you it's different in pharmaceutical, than had the government actually had a seat on the board, right? Because there are certain ways in which companies could, um, Given the distance, both monopolize a certain claim to expertise and information, um, like you know, we can't do this, um, we have to do that, we can't make more vaccines, we can't share that information, we don't know how to do like that. The government couldn't really gain say very easily, particularly in a rapid time frame. And I think um, another piece of it is that they um, that we didn't have the ability to, in fact, contribute to decisions about production. In, um, in user at one point from an arm's length. And so I do think that that's part of the, part of the suite of things we need to be thinking about. And then um, sort of lining up like what the different affordances are that these different techniques offer us and put them all on the team. Sure, uh, so yeah, thank you, Lenore. We absolutely 
Antimonopolists need to expand our imagination. We need to think about a lot more than breakups. I think breakups can be perfectly good remedies in some cases, but they're not going to solve the oligarchy that's confronting us right now. In some cases, breakups can make things worse. And I see this come up in discussions on the power sector, climate change, and people say, well, we need to go out the utility monopoly, monopolies out of control. And I'm not sure what exactly people mean. I'm completely on board when they talk about holding companies, holding companies come back from the power sector, some Berkshire Hathaway, or Buffett's company, all its network of utilities across the country. Yeah, Warren Buffett to sell off some of these utilities. Like he has too much power in the sector. But at the local level, it doesn't make any sense to talk about breakups. What's the alternative? Have three companies build parallel power lines each of each of our homes so they can compete with service? That doesn't make sense. That model was discredited in the late 19th century. It just didn't work. And so we need to be talking a lot more about reconstructing the governance of these institutions. And since we are still talking about monopoly, we're talking about monopoly of finance and shareholders of business enterprises. Why do they get to make all the decisions? Why do they get to set it? Well, not fully, but why do they initially get to set rates? Why didn't they initially get to decide the pace of decarbonization? We should be talking about redistributing power of the enterprise away from finance, toward communities, toward the public, toward workers at these utilities. And so break them up is a really limited vision. I get why people have okay, uh, gravitated toward it. It has relevance and cachet, but it's it's not a sufficient program. And looking outside of the utility sector, we need to be talking more about fair competition, good and bad business models. So for instance, we just break up Facebook into Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. We might actually get more surveillance advertising, most be directly targeted what we need to do. Great. Um, a couple of unconnected thoughts uh, to you guys, because this is great. I'll, uh, bookmarks all around uh, to, to follow up. Um, and hello, Dominic, through the Zoom. Nice to hear your voice through Sunday. Uh, uh, one thought about uh, movement, so I think this goes a little bit to this question earlier, too. Um, I think it's extremely tough. It's extremely tough. I don't have a, uh, an easy answer to this. I think my prudential answer, maybe this is what, what uh, Zanin and Joe, you were getting at, is that we're so far from a universe where that impacted communities of any stripe have any meaningful agency that, like, you know, I almost want to like, trust this that bridge when we get there. Um, but out of conceptual matter, you mentioned this very much, and you'll see that I think it's a little bit goes to um, expression through this. Too. Like, I am fascinated still by models like very budgeting models, like citizen juries and stuff like that. And I think we kind of we know a lot more about how to do those well. Um, I remember when uh, when the 2010 nine stimulus passed, my my sort of uh, kind of aspirational notion at the time was like, oh, what if every big uh, uh, borrow grant came with PB strings attached? And so you can imagine by like extreme frustration that when art was happening, of course we couldn't do anything of the sort. Uh, not just because the money had to go out, you know, like the new dealers, like in a sense, um, but you know, um, and if I be these civilians, like limits the federal government's ability to say any conditions whatsoever, right? Having like personally reviewed every one of those guidance documents, like we had to be extremely careful about like, oh, maybe you could perhaps consider uh, maybe some other kind of thinking about something that vaguely resembles equity when you get this money that we all really can't tell you what to do with. And by the way, Chicago uh, and many other cities and states are still sitting on huge sums of ARP dollars. And so, so you know, uh, if one were to organize, say, in an election that may or may not be coming up soon, like, <laughs> that would be kind of a great thing to, to implement. Um, uh, so, so that's sorry, but then to, to, to your your question, um, I, I love this, of course, um, and I think it's exactly right. And I think of it as like the the range of tools that we have at our disposal. Break up in a and even classic sense, uh, but this is why I'm fascinated by public utility and also corporate governance. I think it's absolutely uh, right to kind of bring it all back in. And for me, that's why like the, the conceptual frame of domination is helpful because if our goal is the contestation of power then we're not necessarily so wedded to like, oh, it's break up all the time, or it's you know, public ownership, shareholders, stakeholder ownership all the time. But it's like strategically, tactically, and in a fact-specific way, what is the cocktail of things that we that we think is optimal, but also what's the cocktail of things that is like plausible in our current moment that will help bootstrap us to the next thing, right? And so um, last thought of this is, uh, 
you know, talking about starting all of this uh, around the dot debates around Dodd Frank, and I think that's when you and I maybe first started talking about some of this stuff too. Uh, but when Sin Silicon Valley Bank just failed, you know, a couple of weeks ago, like it just brings all that like back, right? Bailouts are uh, the bailouts of, of the kind we've done today in finance strike me as a kind of neoliberal industrial policy that you were talking about, Amy and Joel, right? It's uh, it is the, the heavy hand of the state that has created and supported a, a particular sector design. But without any of the kind of accountability or strict attention you could imagine, then like, if we fail, that's like, not bad. Like, what if we own that? Oh, like, I mean, I'm not a finance guy anymore, but like, anyway, these are things that I love to think about. Um, why don't we end it there? Ended a little early, and another round of applause.